do happen to doze off, do not snore, okay? We'll not tolerate the snoring around here. We will baptize you the Methodist style with this water. We'll pour it right on your head. Amen? All right. I enjoyed this morning, didn't you? What a blessing it was. And I'm looking forward to tonight and hearing Brother Johnson and meeting him. And uh, just, it's just a, I love having missionaries around, don't you? It, they just add to the service. They really, really do. And I thank God for that. All right, let's pray. And then we'll have our first couple of songs. Lord Jesus, once again, we're just so thankful to be here. And Lord, were it not for you, we wouldn't be able to be here. There's just no telling where we'd be if we wasn't saved. Some of us might even be dead today in an awful place called hell. But we're saved and here in the house of God with the family of God on our way to heaven. So Lord, while we're here, help us to... Uh, uh, enjoy each other, uh, love each other, love you, tell the lost world about you. Bless the service now, dear God. In thy name we pray, amen and amen. All right, get a songbook in your hand. Amen. All right, let's all stand and we'll sing the first, second, third, and last stanza of 441, 441 Sunlight. Amen. Amen.
glad of that? Uh, we have a great, great victory in Jesus. Actually, we have more than one victory. It's just victory after victory after victory that we have because of him. All right, we'll just hurry through these announcements and then have the choir to sing and then have some special singing <clears throat> and uh, uh, from the Sparks. Sparks, I like that name, Sparks. All you need is a spark to get a fire going. And Miss Linda's leaving because we thought we was going to get her to sing. <laughs> Amen. All right. Well, uh, next Sunday, uh, we're going to have uh, Brother Bob Ford with us. Uh, I don't know what, how many surgeries he's had, 60, 70 surgeries over the years. Brother Bob was with Bearing Precious Seed, one of their uh, missionary workers. And uh, if, you've never, if you've ever met him, uh, you would know what I'm talking about. I say he's a very unusual, very unique preacher. Doesn't preach very dynamically. But I'm telling you, he, he's had some experiences in his life that's unbelievable. Preaches and with the touch of God on him. You will not want to miss next Sunday meeting brother and sister Ford. Now, he's been here before. It's been a while. He's, they've had him dead two or three times, thinking he'd never live through the night, this and that, just all kind of things. Still still has a lot of health issues, but uh, I never forget twice in the last couple of years, uh, just home in the bed, couldn't even get out of the bed. Call me up, Brother Baker? I said, yes, this is Brother Ford. I said, okay, Brother Ford, uh, what can I do for you? He said, well, you could, uh, you and your church could give us about $500. I said, okay, what for? He said, we need, we need to buy a roll of paper to print some Bibles. And what do you think? I said, okay, put us down. We'll, 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 we'll. And so that's what, he, that's what he did all day long. Just calling preachers and saying, we need, we got some, we, we, we've got the, uh, a certain, uh, language in in the bible now we've printed it all we need is the money to ship it or what something like that in different language so i said okay we'll do it i like that don't you now he could just sit back in that bed and done nothing but from his bed calling preacher after preacher after preacher saying can you help can you help what can you do so he'll be here next sunday and uh very very sweet man very sweet and loves the lord Hope you'll be here for that, okay? All right, also, later in the month, uh, of course, uh, in a week or so, we're going to be voting on the Christian Man of the Year, then Father's Day and follow that, and then the uh, uh, last Sunday of the month, uh, we've got uh, Brother Benny Beckham's going to be here. Dr. Beckham will be here. Woo-hoo, boy. And uh, what a preacher. What a preacher. And so he'll be here. Now, Unless something happens, something's happened. Uh, his wife, uh, Debbie, was it Debbie? What's this? No. Oh, can't remember her first name. But anyway, she suffered with cancer and he actually. Huh? What? Yeah. Diane was her name. Diane was her name. Okay. Matter of fact, the last time she sang was in our camp meeting. And she died just a little bit after that. Well, he didn't know what was going to do with his life. He gave up. He just couldn't preach. He had to stay home and take care of her. She had cancer. Well, years have gone by now. And he has met a lady who has never been married. I looked and I said, she your age? He said, yes, but Brother Baker, she don't look my age. She's taking care of herself. I'm, I look... I look like an old man. She don't. And they're supposed to get married, I think, a week or two before they come here. So we might get to meet his new wife. Amen? Won't that be good? And uh, he says she's a godly lady in a wonderful church out in California. He met her out there. And uh, so that's 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 what he told me. He planned on getting married early June. And... Uh, and bring his bride with us. It not be good. Praise the Lord. All right. Okay. Well, don't forget now. We've got some uh, faith uh, promise prayer cards in the foyer if you hadn't got one. 
Hope you'll get it. Put it in your Bible. You can turn it in tonight in the offering plate. Do not put your name on it. Do not put your name on it, okay? And uh, one year, years ago, we put the faith promise cards out. You can tell a kid did it. I reckon a kid did it. And it put on there, you know, uh, uh, I'm now giving, it was like $600 and raised up 6000 I thought, boy, that's good. I wish now they'd put their name on it. <laughs> I'd have went to mom and dad and said, your kid promised this, so you got to help him get it or her get it. Okay. <laughs> all right. Okay. All right. The choir's going to sing. Listen carefully.
shine a little bit. Smile. Give up each other. Give each other Argentina greeting. here. They're going to come and sing seven, eight songs for us. <laughs> Shake them up a little bit when you tell them that. Maybe a couple. That'd be good. All right. I told them earlier, I said uh, about the, the guest house, you know, if it's available, if they up down the highway and need a place to stay, it's free, it's comfortable, it's safe. Amen. And uh, uh, it's good having you with us. I'm glad you could stay both services. Hope you got a little bit of rest too. Normally missionaries, they have one church on a Sunday morning, got to travel so far, the next church that night. It's a bit, Sunday's not a rest day for them. It's go, go, go. And then traveling each week. And so I hope they got a little bit of rest today. Amen. They get through. We'll have a congregational song, receive the offering. Then we'll hear from uh, Brother Johnson. Okay, they're going to come and sing for us. Amen. Those girls need microphones. Yes. Got to hold it just like this. I do it like this. <laughs> you do it like this, not like that. She don't have to hear what she said. Could we be 
so busy being saved trying to impress the world who's long since lost its way we pride ourselves in being set apart yet we don't take time to touch the broken heart even if we found the time to care would we take the risk involved in always being there we hold the very thing they need so much sometimes a word of god can pass through just a simple touch how can we reach a world we've never touched how can we show them christ if we never show them love just to say we care will never be enough how can we reach a world we've never touched we hide behind these walls in the security of friends while beyond the stained glass window the world is lost in sin show them Christ if we never show them love just to say we care will never be enough how can we reach a world we never touch just to say we care will never be enough how can we reach a world we
Jesus gave his life for me. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing Brother Johnson tonight. He's going to come and take the time to share with us the place he's going to. I hate this wife couldn't be here, but she's got a sick baby at home and having to take care of that. Mothers have to do that, you know. And uh, that thought in mind, you know, a lot of times we have the idea. I put a little thing in a Sunday school class. Missionaries have it easy. Piece of cake. But it's not. It is. It's a grueling thing. Now, I, I was talking to them this morning. They were talking about some of the... Uh, the average church treats a missionary halfway decent. They said it was no horror stories to tell. But I think one of the most difficult things to me, you tell me if it's true, is having to call the preachers and saying, I am so-and-so headed to... Argentina, Mexico. Uh, I'd like to be able to come by and present my work to your church if it's possible. It's tough, doesn't it? And here's why. You never know what kind of mood that preacher's in. Now, if he's had a bad day on Sunday, don't call on Monday. Okay? <laughs> or whatever. So I always try to be mindful of that. That's a tough thing because the, the missionary needs the local church, right? And we need the missionary. I've said this quite often, but i say it again. I was many, many, probably 25 years ago at least, I was at a preacher's meeting. And the preacher got up and I don't know, maybe he had a bad day or two. Or maybe some had some bad situations with missionary. He said, I'm, he's, these missionaries are driving me crazy. He said, all the time calling me. Blah, blah, they just aggravate me. I thought, now, isn't that something to say? In a preacher's fellowship. So anyway, I was scheduled to preach later that day. And the Lord told me to tell what I had to say. So I said, you know, I'm glad missionaries are calling me. <laughs> I said, missionaries aren't, they, they're not dumb. They know that not every preacher is going to be able to have them. Every church is going to be able to take them on. But good night. If they're calling me, that means that God's calling them. Okay? And so, if, hey, wouldn't it be something if we had never had a missionary call us? That means no, nobody's going anywhere. The gospel's not getting out. So when they call, that means they're going somewhere. Now, I had one missionary one time I really envied. I really envied this guy. I thought, if he asked me to come on a mission trip, I'm going. He was in Hawaii. <laughs> But he never asked me, Brother Baker, how about taking a mission trip and come over and be with us? Never did. We dropped him too. No, I didn't. No, no. Come on, Brother Johnson. Take your time. Don't be in a hurry, okay? Thank you, God preacher. bless you. Hello, my name is Evie. This is my wife. My wife is my wife. So, my Fang Li, Ming Bai Ma, Ming Bai Ma. You don't get that? No. <laughs> I didn't tell you I was going to speak in tongues. Uh, it was good. I said, my name is Ben. This is my daughter, Evie. Our, my wife is at home. Our son is sick. And do you understand? And uh, we are glad to be here tonight. We are missionaries to China. Now, I grew up in church, and Easter is always a big deal. April 5th this year, you get up and it was always a big deal because, well, it's kind of Super Bowl Sunday for churches. You know, that's the big day. That's, that's it. And that was definitely it for my church. I grew up in church. I grew up, my parents gave me two choices. I could go to church. I could get beat half to death. 
I went to church. And growing up in church, you know, Easter was a big deal because, you know, we always had something going on at the church, something big, some special music. We'd get new clothes, a new suit, a new shirt, new tie, new dress. I never got a new dress. Let me clarify that. New, new dresses. And, and so we had all this new stuff and, and we would go to church because it was always a big deal. It was always a big deal because it was the day we celebrated our risen Savior. It was the day that we got together and we showed something that no religion in this world has, which is a risen Savior. Yeah. And that's what we had to celebrate. So it was always big. Well, it wasn't that way in China this year. April 5th, the Chinese, they got up and they went to the graveyard, many of them. But it wasn't like we would do here. Many churches having sunrise services at a graveyard. You see, they got up and they did go to their graveyard, but it was Qingming Festival, tomb sweeping. And they would go there because it was the time of year they needed to take some incense and put it in front of the, the pot there on the tomb of their, of their families and offer prayers to their dead relatives. It was the time of year that they would have a meal and have a picnic there in the graveyard and they, they would set out a place for their relative who's died. That they'd go there and they would take, we have it on our table here. Many people have asked me about this. They take this, it's called Joss paper. Looks like money. It says hell banknote on it. And they'd burn stacks of it because you see, you need spending cash in the afterlife. And so all of this, while we celebrated our risen Savior here in America, they celebrated their dead. They had no hope because they had no Savior but in themselves. Hopefully when I'm dead, my relatives will come and visit me. And that's all they got. But we don't have that. We have a real hope tonight. A real hope not based in anything that is ourselves, but based in Jesus Christ. We have a hope tonight that no matter what happens in this life, we don't have to worry about it because we have a risen Savior tonight. But the truth is we forget it. We often forget the hope we have because, well, life gets hard. We look at this world. We look at what's going on. We see our country. Sometimes you can look at what's going on in our country, what's going on in the world, and we lose hope. We forget the hope we have, we think we've lost. We might as well huddle up and just kind of wait till Jesus comes back because we forget it. But you know what? You can look at China and you can think the same way. You see this number here, 1.35 billion people. It's a number that does not make sense to us. No. It really doesn't. It's a big number. It's a number that it doesn't. So let me try and put it a little bit in perspective tonight. I lived there with my family for six months. That's how I know how to speak awful Chinese. And we lived there. And during this, my apartment complex was eight stories tall, about seven buildings. If you take my apartment complex, which is a smaller one, the one across the street, which is a bigger one, take two of those, two apartment complexes in one city is bigger than this whole county. It's a big place. Many, many, many people. And if I could take you down, take you through that apartment complex, you would see people, they say, Ren Shan Ren Hai, which means people mountain, people see, because that's what it is. You would see so many people as you walk down the street and see the crowds of people. And if you walk and you look at them and you look real closely, you see on their forehead, very closely, it says, condemned already, because that is what they are. That they are condemned. They have not the truth. They've never heard the truth. And if you could come to China and simply tell them four syllables. Yesu Jidu, which is Jesus Christ in Chinese. It would take you 43 years to tell every single Chinese person that. So you look at this and it's huge. You look at this and it's a communist country. We still can't go in as missionaries. And though it's opened up for many years ago, it was closed. It's opened up a little bit, but technically still what we're doing is illegal. I'm going as a drug dealer in some ways. <laughs> and so we have all this, but you know what? The truth is we've already won. We've already won. We already have the victory. Even in this country, no matter what happens, we already have the victory because what Christ has done on Calvary. And as I already heard it, we have victory after victory after victory. Why? Because of what Jesus has done. The book you hold tonight, this tells us what the end is. And I can tell you now, we've already won. And so we can go to China. We can know we've won. It doesn't matter what the government tells us. We know the gospel works tonight. And that should give us hope. Because I know we serve a God who opens doors. Yes, that we can go into China, not completely open, but it is open enough. We can preach the gospel there. We know it. I've done it. We've gone there on the university campuses where we would walk on there and they say, hey, you're not Chinese. And I'd say, how do you know? 
And uh, they know pretty easily. And we'd walk on there and they'd say, really, who are you? I'd say, my name's Ben. I'm from America. I'm a Bible teacher. They'd say, really, what's the Bible teach? I'd say, that's a great question. Did you know that you're a sinner? Let me explain what that means from the Bible and be able to witness to a dozen or so Chinese students at one time. We have no problems with that, no problems admitting even that we're Christians. That's legal. It is illegal, though. We're going to start churches. But even with that, we found it's kind of like, well, I'm from Georgia, and uh, we have fireworks laws, but they're there, but they're not really there. If you're familiar with Georgia, we have fireworks. If it shoots over eight feet in the air, it's illegal. In other words, we can't have real fireworks. Unless, of course, you live where I live, I can make it to Tennessee, South Carolina, and Alabama within two hours. I admit to nothing in this. Nothing. And you can say, hypothetically, buy fireworks in these countries, eh, or countries, yeah, uh, <laughs> in these states, and you can bring them back into Georgia. And all over Georgia, 4th of July, New Year's Eve, you'll see fireworks going off all over the country, and uh, somehow our police don't seem to notice. Now, obviously, they know what's going on, but they don't enforce those laws. And that's what we found in China. I can take you to churches that 12 hours ago, if you were to go there and be there at their services, these are churches that the police have been to. Churches that the, police, the pastors have been arrested. They've been questioned. But you know what? One of those churches that they've been taken into custody, the pastor has been talked to the police multiple times. You know what? They just moved into a new place. Why? They're growing. They need more space. Wow. Now we know that there is an opening there that to these churches, they keep having to get bigger spaces because God keeps blessing and the government knows they're there, but they do no, nothing with them. And that's what's exciting, what we can see done in China. And yes, it can be discouraging. I think of a guy named Ryan. Ryan, he grew up like any other Chinese person. He grew up in a city called Xinjiang in Northeast China. This city is bigger than 43 or 50 U.S. states. And he grew up there, and, and he grew up with a lot of pressure to do well in school, and he did well, and he passed his college entrance exam. That's the biggest test in China, because this test determines the rest of your life. What you'll go to study in college, if you get into college, and of course that determines what job you're going to get. Well, he did well, and he's going to go into physics. Well, he got his bachelor's degree in physics and said, that's great, I think I'll get my master's. So he got his master's degree in physics. He's 25 years old. He said, I'm going to get my PhD too. And he begins work on his PhD. He's 25 years old. He's never heard the gospel, never heard the truth, never even heard of Jesus Christ. And he's getting his PhD in physics. Well, he met a missionary and the missionary began to witness to him, began to tell him the gospel. And he invited him to church and he came to church and heard the truth. And it scared him because he heard, yes, he could have all of his sins forgiven. But at the same time, he heard, I might get ridiculed. As the Bible says, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And he heard that and he said, I don't think I want that. If it costs that much, I don't think I want to be Christian. I don't want any part of this. And so he walked out and he said, I know the truth, but I don't want it. But that's not a, tr that's not a story for China. That's a story for Walterboro, South yes, Carolina. It is. That so many hear the truth and so many will come to this church and hear the gospel and hear it in their head and know what it says. They might have even grown up in church hearing the truth of the gospel. Yeah, and they walk right. out those doors just that's as lost exactly as when right. they came in. Yes, so many people do it. I grew up in the South. Oh, I don't God. sound like it. I sound like a Yankee. I get accused of that everywhere I go. But I grew up in the South. I know, well, we have a kind of a mix here, so I won't say it, but I will. Uh, real football, SEC football. Some of you will say amen, some of you won't. Uh, <laughs> but we have that, and we have, uh, you know, I grew up, I knew grits are for breakfast. Tea should be sweet, and we have all these things. But you know what? We also have a lot of people who know the truth, but walk out those doors lost. And we have that so much. And so we can get so bogged down in that. But look, open your Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I want to show you two reasons why we have hope tonight. Two reasons why we have the victory. In 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, not chapter 5, chapter 4. Chapter 4, I'll go ahead and start reading. Verse number 5 is where I start. For we preach not ourselves to Christ Jesus, the Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, here we see two reasons why we have hope. First of all, because we preach Jesus Christ. Christ. That's what it says in verse five or verse five. It says, for we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus, the Lord. We don't preach ourselves because I can't save anyone in and of myself. 
I know I can't save China. I can't save America. I couldn't save my wife. I can't save my daughter. I can't save my son. I couldn't save me. That's why I needed Jesus Christ. That without him, we have nothing tonight. That's right. Without Jesus Christ, without him coming to this earth and dying on the cross, our faith is in vain. It's worthless. It means nothing. Without Jesus Christ, this mural, this wonderful thing here, there's no boat. We're all just there in the water. There is no boat without Jesus Christ. Without Jesus Christ, we have no reason to meet, no reason to sing, no reason to say it's under the blood. I love that song. No reason whatsoever. No reason to have us as missionaries here. No reason to go out. No reason to celebrate because we're yet in our sins. If Christ didn't come and he didn't die on the cross and he didn't rise again, we have nothing. nothing. We're just like every other religion in this world. Yeah. No matter what they call themselves, they're just the same because they have no Jesus Christ risen from the dead. But you see, tonight we know he came to this earth and he died on the cross and he rose again. And when he died on that cross, he didn't just die for my sins. He died for all men's sins. He died as much for me as he did for the Chinese people. He died as much for me as he did for the Chileans. He died as much for me as anyone else in this world. And that should give us hope that as we tell people about Jesus Christ, that he meant it when he said it is finished, that all their sins can be forgiven, that Christ paid for them all. And that should give us hope because you can walk out tonight, you can take a track, find someone, find them at a gas station, find them on the road, say, look, Christ loved you, he died for you. And it's true. You can come with me, get on a plane from, a from Atlanta. It takes about 15 hours. You can get off the plane, say, yes, who do I need? And that is just as true there as well. And that should give us hope tonight. Mm -hmm. That we can tell anyone in Christ died for them. And not just that, we have hope tonight because we know God can save. Verse number six says, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Imagine this, there was nothing at one point. I mean nothing, nothing, nothing. There was no time, there was no matter, there was no energy. It was just God. And God in this nothing says, I'm going to make everything. And he says, let there be light. Bang, light everywhere. That's incredible power. I mean, that would be incredible. If we need a new building built, we could just say, let there be a new building. Bang, new building. That'd be wonderful. But we can't do that. We can't understand that kind of power because we can't do it. I mean, walk into your house tonight dark house, walk in and say, let there be light. See what happens. It doesn't count if you have one of those clap on things. That doesn't count at all. But that is how powerful our God is. And when there was nothing, he just speaks it and it happens. When there was nothing, he just says it and it happens. That is how powerful our God is. Well, you see that same power to make the light shine out of darkness, that same power to make the light shine out of nothing, that same power that we can't understand is the same power to make the light of the gospel shine in the hearts of That's men. Right. Yeah. That it doesn't matter how blind yeah. someone may be. It doesn't That's matter right. how hard-hearted someone may be, how delusional uh, someone may be. God can save them, and that should give right. us hope. Thank now, God. as we look at people, we can look at them, and the truth is this. We can look at them and say, God can't save them. We can look at people and we can say, oh, they are too worldly. Mm -hmm. We look at the Chileans, mostly Catholics, say they're too religious. You look at the Chinese and say they're too atheist. I look at Ryan and say he's too smart. I mean, this guy's studying physics. I can't spell physics. And he, you're going to give the gospel to this guy? God can't save him. And we lose hope. Especially we lose hope with people that we know know the truth. That they've heard it and they know it. And they've come to this church and they've heard it in their head, and they're just as lost right now as when they heard it the first time. And it breaks our hearts, and we think God will never save them because they just won't believe. Well, I tell you tonight, don't give up hope. God can save them. Don't give up hope. And how do you know this? Well, it says it in the verse, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts. And this is the key, that if God can save me, God can save anyone. If God can save me, God can save a Chinese person. If God can save me, he can save a Chilean. If God can save me, he can save an Argentine. If God can save me, he can save someone in South Carolina. If God can save me, God can save anyone. And that should give us hope tonight. Because no, I, there is no reason why I should be saved more than anyone else. I was just as deserving as hell as anyone else. Just as lost as anyone else. Just as in need of a savior as anyone else yet God used the gospel being preached to me working in my heart that I could put my faith in Jesus if he can do that for me 
He can do it for anyone. There is no difference. Except I got to hear the truth. And that's what it all takes. That they can hear the truth. And I know God can save Chinese because I've seen him do it. Ryan walked out on God. He said, I'm done with God. But God was not done with Ryan. Amen. Ryan kept going around. But you know what? God kept working in his heart. God kept convicting him of his sin and saying, you need to be saved, Ryan. Ryan, you need Jesus Christ. And he kept working and kept working till he came back to that church. And he said, I don't care what it costs me. I want to be a Christian. And he put his faith in Jesus Christ. And Ryan got saved. Amen. Now Ryan wants to be in the ministry and he's looking to lose everything. Amen. That is what our God can do. Yes, it is. So tonight, is there someone lost that you've given up hope on? Someone you care about, someone you think about. That they, if they were to die tonight, you know they'd go straight to hell. Maybe you don't even know if they're alive and you've lost hope. Don't. God can save them. Amen. And if there's one thing you can do for them tonight, you can start by praying for them. I believe one great example of that, actually, she isn't here, and that's my wife. My wife didn't grow up like I did. I had both my parents grew up in a Christian home. My wife grew up, her mother was and still is an alcoholic. From the time my wife was born till she was nine years old, she was in and out of foster care. About the time she turned nine, she got saved. And about that time, her mom lost custody of her for good, and she went to go live with her grandmother. Her name's Miss Evelyn Green. That's why her daughter's name is Evelyn, but we knew her as Meemaw. Meemaw's a sweet, godly lady. She loved Jesus. She loved the Bible. She loved church. This was a woman that just radiated godliness. Well, Miss Green got older and she couldn't do as much, but she knew she was able to pray. So often because of her health problems, she'd wake up in the middle of the night. She'd wake up and she'd get on her walker and she'd scoot her way into the kitchen and turn the corner and open up a little drawer. And she'd pull out this list right here. Just a bunch of names. And she'd pray through each and every one of those names. Amen. Amen. And I have no doubt in my mind, one of the reasons I have the wonderful wife that I do today that is taking care of our son, that's going to go to China with me and learn Chinese and tell Chinese women about Jesus because my wife's name is right there. Amen. That's wonderful. So tonight, who can you pray for? Wow. Who can you pray for? You see, my wife's grandmother, she passed away in 2009. She never got to see her granddaughter go to China. Never got to see all that God would do with her in this life. But one day she can. You see, tonight, you might pray for someone and say, I prayed for him for a while, but nothing happened. You know what? Keep praying. Keep praying. Keep praying. You don't know what God will do. And you say, well, I might not see anything happen in this life. No, you might not. You might pass away. God might take you home. Jesus might come back. But you know what? One day you might be in heaven and that God can say, this is what I did. Why? Because you prayed. Because you prayed. This is what I did. Because you prayed. These people got saved. Because you prayed. These lives were chained. All because you prayed. Mm -hmm. And you had a part in that. Yeah. So who can you pray for tonight? You know, the great thing about prayers, you know what? They might not listen to you. They can't get away from God. And that should give us hope. We know this. Christ died for all men and God can save any man so I simply ask you this who can you pray for tonight please keep us in our prayers as I said I do believe prayer works take our prayer card cover my ugly face pray for us as we go to China easy way to remember us uh, I always come to churches in my authentic Chinese clothing uh, I did tonight uh, I bought it in Georgia but it's all made in China so the easy way to remember us <laughs> So keep us in your prayers. We're at 77% of our support. Lord will, not Lord willing. Well, Lord willing, we are leaving in February. You say, how do you know that? Because I bought my plane tickets. So we are leaving in February. We'd love for you to have a part in what God is doing in China. It's an amazing ministry. So keep us in your prayers. Get our prayer card. Sign up. As Brother Bateman said this morning, we have once a week. You'll get an email keeping you updated of what God is doing with us. And thank you so much, Pastor. Isn't that wonderful? My, my, my. What a blessing. Tell you what. We had taken an offering yet, haven't we? we? Got to take an offering, hadn't we? All right, Brian, you come. Let's sing a couple verses of song. Everything you give tonight, go toward these preachers. We give them all a good love offering. And uh, we want to do that tonight. Amen. What page? 542. 
542. 542, let's stand and sing the first and last verse. Receive tonight's other's offering. the offering we're about to receive. Lord, we pray tonight we could be a real blessing to the missionaries that are here. Oh, Lord, a good offering. We ask you, God, to meet every need they have as they travel, the support they need to get to the country. And Lord, I ask you now to watch over us as we give. May we give obediently again tonight. In thy name I pray. Amen. said, Preacher, we sure have enjoyed these two missionaries last this last week and this week. That's why I said, well, you hadn't preached more than five minutes. Let's have one every week. Amen. Uh, I'm just going to be brief again tonight, honestly, but I want to read, I want to read some scripture to you out of the book of Acts chapter 27. You know, there's danger everywhere, isn't it? Would you agree with that? There's danger everywhere. No place is really safe. And if the devil could, he would like to see every, every Christian that's serving God quit on God. He'd like to do anything he could to stop them. You know, the devil tried to stop Jesus. Didn't, didn't work, did it? Time and time again. Even before Jesus ever came, he tried to break the lineage. Didn't work. 
And the devil's going to fight these missionaries. He's going to fight you. In the book of Acts chapter 27, I begin reading in verse 38. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and cast out the wheat into the sea. And when it was day, they knew not the land, but they discovered a certain creek with a shore into the which they were minded, if it were possible, to thrust in the ship. And when they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves unto the sea. Notice that they, they committed themselves to the sea and loosed the rudder bands and hoisted up the mainsail to the wind and made toward shore. And falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground and the fore part stuck fast and remained unmovable, but the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. So the ship is being torn to pieces by the storm and the waves, just torn to pieces. And by the way, there's, there's, uh, uh, there's 276 people on this ship. And it says, uh, verse 42, And the soldiers' counsel was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape. So now they're going to kill all the kill Paul and all the prisoners. But the centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that they would could swim, that they which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land. And the rest, some on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship, so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. Brother Baker, why do you read that? What, what's the purpose of that? Well, it's to tell you that the devil wants every missionary dead. The devil wants every godly preacher dead. I mean dead. Complete, I mean dead and gone. And he'll do anything he can to keep these men and their families from getting to where God wants them. And so we need to pray for them. So it's often important that you pray one for another. You see, now a person who is not living for God, a saved person who's just living for themselves, the devil's not going to mess much with them. But somebody who loves the Lord, wants to serve God, he's going to mess with them. Now I gave these, these 13 things this morning, but before I read these to you, uh, I thought about a, a comment I made last week in Sunday school, and I want to repeat it to you again. Sometimes when you give to missionaries or give to the cause of Christ, Sometimes now, sometimes this is true. It's not so much how you how, how much you give is how much you keep. You know, uh, there was a man and woman in the first uh, in the first church of Jerusalem who sold a piece of ground and and got got more for it than they thought, and they gave. And everybody thought they gave a lot, but God said you kept back what you said you'd give. So a lot of times God looks at us and said, and, and we might be sometimes thinking we're giving a lot, and God says, look how much you kept. And then I thought about this, you know, when we, when we, you know, these missionaries that we are supporting now and the ones we hope to support, when they go anywhere, whether it be in the States, out West or somewhere, or to a foreign country, they become our eyes, and they become our hands and our feet and our ears. They become our heart. Why? Because I can't go. God didn't call me to go to China or Chile or Argentina or another country. So those that he did call, when these fellows get there and we support them, they're going to be our eyes. And we're going to hear from them. They're going to, they're going to speak for us. They, now, we know they're going to speak for the Lord, but they're going to speak for us too. Now, we, we have some missionaries we, we support right now that we've been supporting probably 20, 20, 25, 30 years. And the day we took them on, we may have seen them one time since. But we get the month letter from them or when they, they notify us, we read it to church and we continue to pray for them. I mean, we've had some to come here when they were young and their children were little. Now those kids are grown. They got, they got grandkids. And they'll call us their brother Baker. We're home on furlough. Would you like for us to come by and, and share a few things? And I said, well, you can, but you don't have to. I know you need support. And I know you're home. You probably need support. Yeah, we do. Well, you don't have to come by. If you can get to a church and get you a little more support, I want them to get it. Amen? Amen. And so the missionaries. Now, 
I read these in Sunday school this morning. I'm going to go through them and might make a, a comment or two. The missionaries must have, we, they must have this. They must have God's specific call on their life. I mean, they must know exactly where God wants them to be. Not any general idea. Well, I think he wants me over there somewhere. No, the missionary must know. Now, here's why. For his own sake and for the sake of his wife and his children. It'd be horrible for a missionary to get somewhere and get there and say, you know, I'm not sure about this. Yet he's told his wife and told his kids and told his home pastor, told about it's where God wants us. When they get there, they say, you know, I think I missed it. Boy, that's horrible. And it does happen. They must, they must have God's specific call in their life. Number two, they must, they must have God's unlimited power. Why? Because his power is unlimited. He's an all-powerful God. And it's going to be that power that they've got to have if they're going to be what God needs them to be. And by the way, you need that same power. It's not just for a missionary. Number three, listen, they need God's divine wisdom. Divine wisdom, not human wisdom. Now, what, what, what does that mean, preacher? Divine wisdom is, is accompanied by a heavenly discernment. Wisdom is the discernment of God. God nudges a man and he says, here's what I want you to do right now. And it may seem strange to the world. It may seem strange to the Chinese or the Japanese or whatever. But God's, God's divine wisdom. I pray for that every week that God would give me divine wisdom. They're going to have to have the Holy Spirit's fullness. Somebody said, well, we need a touch of the Holy Spirit. No, we need more than a touch. So we need the whole bucket load. We just don't need, I mean, my wife can touch me, but we need, we need a, a they need and we need the Holy Spirit's fullness. Be filled with the Spirit. They need Bible knowledge. They have studied, they've prayed, been in church, and they do have some Bible knowledge, but you know what? They'll never know it all. But they're going to need to know that Bible when they get there. Because if they don't know that Bible, they're going to be in big trouble. They need Bible knowledge. They need to have a tight-knit family. Which means when they get there, that's all they got for the time being. Him and her and the kids can, hey, you got two children? Three, three children. Tight-knit. Which means that he's got to give his wife time. His children, in other words, he take, he can't just go to the mission field and say, honey, you're on your own. He still must maintain that tight-knit family. Why? Because that's what's going to hold them together. Every missionary needs that. God's protecting hand. They must have God's protecting hand. Boy, I'll tell you what, these lands are going to, and America's dangerous, but buddy, you go to a foreign land, where it's full of paganism and ritualism. There's no telling what could happen to them. They need God's protecting hand, God's providing hand. They, a missionary is going to get to a place and, and they can't ride down to Walmart in, in, in those places and pick something up. They're going to need God's providing hand. And then they're going to have, have, must have prevailing prayer. Spend time in prayer. They must have teaching and preaching skills. Teaching the teaching. Remember, there's, there's a difference between teaching and preaching. Teaching affects your, your thinking, but preaching affects the heart. So you got to have both teaching and preaching skills. Courage for the dangers. Woohoo! It's going to be a. They going to have some have some real courage. Go face. I read. That's why I read the scripture here. That's a dangerous thing, wasn't it? Oh boy. But Paul said, I told you not to leave, but you left now that you left, everything's going to be okay. There are going to be times they're going to face situations, but the peace of God will say it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Courage for the dangers. Faith, faith overcome their fears. They're going to have some fearful times overseas. And they'll need faith to overcome those fears. And then last of all, they got to learn to adapt. They must learn to adapt. 
And that's true in life, isn't it? Learning to adapt all the way through. But buddy, learning to adapt here in America is a world of difference in learning how to adapt in a foreign country. Language, and even, even the foreign countries have different dialects. You may speak, I mean, I speak a, a dialect in one, one region and it may be different than another. They must learn to adapt, eating their diet, all kind of things. What to look out for, what to say, what not to say, people's behavior. Just like we heard this morning from the Argentinian missionary. <laughs> You're going to stick your hand and shake hands, they'll, think, they'll punch you in the nose. Okay? And uh, I mean, over there, a greeting is a, 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 a facial gesture with a little kiss on the cheek. I'm not going to Argentina. <laughs> well, I say that. I about not say that. Amen. I about not say that. I don't want to go to Argentina, okay? But anyway, and so I hope tonight these few little things here and what you've experienced last week and what you've experienced today, God will use thee to speak to your heart about these missionaries. And I don't know uh, what you have in your heart and your mind about, about your increase in faith promise giving. I hope it'll be sufficient that we can help these fellows out and their families. These are real people, just like you and I, with their, did you see all the kids running around? And they, 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 they loved each other. They, they just, with each other. But buddy, when you get in a foreign country, you don't have that. They love the fellowship. When you get to a foreign country, you don't have it. So let's pray for them, okay? We're going to give an invitation. Maybe somebody here, maybe God's dealing with your heart about the mission field. Maybe some young man, maybe it's a young lady that God's speaking to you about marrying a missionary, being, being in full-time ministry in some way, not necessarily preaching, but that God would use you in the mission field somehow or another. Amen. Let's pray. Now, Holy Spirit, we're so thankful for your presence this morning and again tonight. Thank you for the message, dear God, from Brother Johnson. Lord, I pray that you will help him. I pray you'll bless his sick little daughter at home and his wife. And I pray, Lord, that you meet all their needs. Give them the support they need, dear God. But Lord, I pray that you will enable us here at this little country church to increase our giving that we could be a help to all these missionaries. We sure want to do it, God, so we're going to look at you to tell us how to do it. Please bless it now. In thy name I pray. Amen and amen. Let's stand to our feet once again. The Lord speaks to your heart. You want to come and pray, come on. duplexes more people live in this whole that live in this whole county in two buildings it's hard to believe isn't it but listen to this every one of them have a soul everyone that's going to live forever Jesus died for them their skin's a little bit different than ours their eye texture's not like ours their culture is different. Very educated. Very intelligent. But in darkness. China is a spiritual nation. That's all. Just spiritual. They need the gospel. They need the gospel. Praise the Lord. It's been a wonderful day, hasn't it? Amen. I know some of you probably have said it's been a long day, preacher. It's been a long week. Amen. And, uh, and, and you know what? Tomorrow's Monday. You get home this afternoon and 
tonight, get you, try to get you some rest, okay? Uh, tell, tell about Miss Baker. This is, this is a good little story about the hot dogs. Yeah. Last week we had the, uh, fed the missionaries and Miss Baker to fix some hot dogs. So, well, she's going to take Leo and his wife some hot dogs. So she fixed them, put the weenie in the bun and put the bun in and put the ketchup mustard in there, you know, and, and uh, she did that. I, I, I forget a bunch of them. And then she had a, a pack of rug of hot dog buns left. So she goes over to Leo's, drops them off. So I get home. I'm going to fix me a hot dog. So I look there and I open up the, to get a bun out. I said, hmm, these already got the weenies in it. <laughs> well, she don't know that yet. So I am fixed me one, you know, and I said, honey, these hot dogs are good. I said, you already got them in the bun? She said, in the bun? I said, yeah, these, these are in the bun. She said, oh, no. I said, what's going on? She said, well, I thought about Leo and Belinda, and I took them six hot dogs with the weenie in the bun with the mustard and ketchup and the packages in it, but I left him just a bunch of just buns. With nothing, just six buns. She said, I brought you some hot dogs. What did you do, preacher? I ate them. I thank God for them and then ate them, amen. Well, that's what goes on in our house. She'll make a mistake and I'll make a mistake and we just rub in each other's face. Good night, we'll see you Wednesday night, seven o'clock. Come by the display table one more time.